So we're going to define source of income or SOI. We're going to go over the problems caused by the lack of source of income coverage. And we're going to look, go through review jurisdictions that have source of income protections. And we're going to discuss a sample ordinance or statute and the certain exemptions that you may see in them. And then what kind of actions violate source of income protections. And of course, we'll have time for Q&A and any encore, any discussion after the webinar without any recording. Just real quick, uh, definition of source of income. That's a you know, basic question. And it should be distinguished from regular income. Income means how much. Deals with how much income someone has. And landlords, housing providers are always free to consider tenants' ability to pay rent or other financial obligations such as utilities, water bill, things of that nature. And there's no fair housing issue there. The question we're going to be looking at today, however, is source of income. Source of income deals with where from. Where did the income come from? Theoretically, the source of income should not really matter to a landlord or housing provider. One would think it wouldn't, but apparently you know, it's become a, a very controversial type thing. Um, if you want in the chat, you could add in, let me open up my chat here. Do you think that source of income, someone's source of income should matter? I know when you go into a store, you know, if you pay cash or card or, or you know, I'm not sure that really matters. And the other thing is when you make payments for groceries or gas or things like that, uh, no one looks at you and say, well, where did that money come from? You know, um, but it seems to matter a lot when it comes to housing. Should it matter? Should it matter to a landlord or housing provider where someone's income came from? That's the question. Right? So we're going to look at that and uh, take a you know, close look at source of income. First, I want to explore problems caused by lack of source of income coverage. Here's a news story. I didn't find a news story actually in Michigan, believe it or not, on source of income. Um, but I found one that's really apt in um, North Carolina. Here in Charlotte, there is such a demand for places to live that landlords can be picky. Many will not even rent to people who get the government subsidies known as Section 8. Action and investigator Jason Stujanki says it sounds like illegal discrimination, but it's not. Jason? Yeah, well, that's right. More than 5,000 people are on Section 8 here in Charlotte and thousands more are on the waiting list. Now, many tell me it's hard to find decent housing, even with that. Hey, go take me to the check. Shelly Fenley is missing a leg. <laughs> Angela Hargrove has MS. When she found out, it was completely devastating. I cried all the way home. <laughs> both are on Section 8. And both say multiple landlords mm -hmm. weren't willing to rent to them. How many places do you think you got turned down from? Jesus. At least 15. 15 places if turned not down. more. Can you believe it's legal? No, it shouldn't be. It's like, I have a play. It's like, we have a play. Family finally found an apartment, but it's on the second floor, hard with a wheelchair. I didn't think it would be this difficult. I really didn't. Hargrove is still looking for a place. She's all but given up, ready to move back to New York, where she says it was actually easier. I was born in North Carolina. I've lived in New York most of my life, and I really wanted to come back. But you can't. Not at the moment, no. We found all of these rental ads on Craigslist, landlords who won't take Section 8, landlords like Mark Holton. You know, everything in here is new. He isn't hurting for renters. He told me there's so much demand, he got about six calls per day on this house alone. It, it's just been insane, actually. So he can be selective. He says Section 8 has too much red tape. I now have to get an inspection, you know, wait two weeks. I'm not getting paid. Um, typically, the renter will be in the, in the property while you're doing all this. They're going to find something wrong. They always do. You got to get a reinspection. And, uh, you know, it's just difficult when, you know, I'm not... Donald Trump or anything, I got to carry these mortgages, I got to pay them. Plus, it's perfectly legal to say no. 
But would you outlaw it? Would you keep it the way it is? City Council Member Braxton Winston says he feels for the renters. I believe that a, a Section 8 voucher should not preclude anybody uh, from uh, having uh, a safe and secure home in the city of Charlotte. He wants to study the issue more. And now that Action 9 brought it up, he's officially asking the city attorney to research the city's legal options. Now, since then, a second council member also plans to look into this. I'll stay on top of it, let you know what happens. And at last check, 13 states and more than 60 cities and counties have outlawed it, but none in the Carolinas. Guys? Thanks, Jason. So here's uh, so a little bit more information. The, no, the National Low Income Housing Coalition put an article out, The Gap Shortages Affordable Homes. And it you know, used a standard breakdown uh, by income levels. And there's also uh, the lowest average median income, AMI, is the me median family income in a metropolitan or non-metropolitan area. What I'm focusing on specifically is extremely low income ELI households. They're at or below poverty guidelines and their income is 30% of average median income. So that the poverty guidelines or 30% of AMI, whichever is lower. And there's other categories as well, very low income, low income and so forth. And at the bottom, there's a cost burden. People that are spending 30% or more of their household income on housing costs, and a severe cost burden is families that spend more than 50% of their household income on housing costs alone. And in the country, the US has currently has a shortage of 7.4 million affordable renter homes available to extremely low income renter households, resulting in 35 affordable and available units for every 100 extremely low income renter households. This is kind of a breakdown of it. And it shows at extremely low income, there's only 35 units. At people that are 50% of AMI, there's only 55 households. So you really have to be up to 80% and above before there's sufficient households for families to live. Within the country, you can see where Michigan is at 38%, not the worst, but on the certainly on the bottom when it comes to affordable households per ELI renter. And it kind of numerically showing the comparisons here. Uh, Michigan, when you look at percent within each income category with, um, with severe housing cost burden, Michigan is at 72% of extremely low income families have extreme housing cost burden, meaning their housing costs each month are over 50% of their income. I don't know, uh, kind of a mistake that it's not in red, if you look at Arizona is in red at 72%, Michigan should be in red as well. So we have a problem with affordable housing. Uh, this is a Urban Institute report a couple of years back showed lack of affordable housing units. In Macomb County, there are only 30.8 units per 100 ELI families, 31.7 for Oakland County and 39.9 within Wayne County. Still very, very low. And what happens too is that homelessness climbs. There's kind of points at which the homelessness climbs up when rent affordability reaches a 22% threshold and 32% threshold. Doesn't hardly show what happens as families get over 50% threshold, but you can see the likelihood of homelessness really starts to increase. So it's a problem. Um, what are the results of a lack of affordable housing? What do families do? How do you think they deal with it? Right. Where do people live? I see, or in our office, we see all the time people going into homes that aren't habitable. And they're unable to go into habitable homes or they go into homes that are not habitable just because they have no other options and they're desperate to find a place to live and they accept it and they can be victimized at times. Um, nationwide, the eviction rate is six to 
I mean, one eviction filing rate for six to seven percent of all rental households, or roughly one eviction filing for every 17 renter households. In Michigan, the statewide eviction rate in 2008, there was a big study on Michigan evictions. It was done by uh, U of M, poverty uh, program, and other groups, legal services assisted with that. But statewide in Michigan, their, the eviction filing rate was 17%, 17 eviction filings for every 100 households. That's almost three times the national rate. Amazing. Really, it really computes to one eviction case for every six rental household housing units in the state. You often don't hear anything about it, which is shocking when it's this high. Within Genesis County, Genesee County, it's 25.7%. Macomb and Wayne are in 23, 24%, Oakland County at 19%. They're extremely high, very high. Within large cities, it got as high as 47% for Romulus, 39.8 for Inkster, and so on. This is far too high. You want to see it on a visual map. It shows, you can see Southern Michigan, Southeast Michigan is very, very high in terms of the eviction filings. This is a major crisis. Again, why I'm bringing up the lack of affordable housing for extremely low-income families and talking about the eviction rate and possibly of homelessness is to show why source of income is overdue when it comes to a need for being adopted. Home means to me a place of peace, a place of serenity, a place where you can find comfort and it's an escape from everyday life and the outside world. You can just come in and let your hair down and be yourself and just breathe, relax. And it's a safe haven. That's what home is to me. My name is Destiny. I'm a working mom. I have a son, Messiah, who's three years old, and I am a case manager in my community in the Department of Health and Human Services. My average day at work will have clients come in who really need this help. They, you know, are at their wits end. They don't know what to do. They're on the verge of homelessness. They have children, and it hurts to see that. Towards the end of 2017, being though that I am a subcontractor, our hours got cut. It caused me to fall behind on rent and utilities as well, and you, those things climb fast. January 1st, my rent is due. January 5th was considered late, and you have to pay a $50 late fee. January 12th, they file for an eviction, and that's another 57 for their filing. You constantly have it in the forefront of your mind. I need to get this money up. I'm not going to have this home. Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? Just knowing that you don't have that money is heart throbbing. The actual day that I got this notice, it was like, I have a long day, you know, at work. And I had my son with me. And then I come home to see this notice on the outside of my door. And and to me, that's just like, you know, I, I can't. Those are my words, like, I just can't. And then only thing I looked for was the court date, the time I need to be there. If I can literally describe that feeling, it's like taking a deep breath, jumping in a pool of water and staying down there for as long as you can. That feeling of holding your breath, that's what it feels like. It crushes you, but you gotta keep moving. It's quite a story. Do you know anyone who's been evicted? And if so, what happened to the family as a result of the eviction? Where did they go? What did they do? 
that's a real concern for families. Here's a, um, and Christopher, one person was homeless long-term. Yeah. It, it, we can't wave a wand. We can't sweep it all away and solve the problem with evictions and homelessness and that. But we can take steps to actually make a difference. That's the goal here, right? And I'm obviously I'm advocating for source of income, make no excuses about it. Um, and to show why I think it should be, it's long overdue and it should have been adopted. Uh, section eight, or there's two main source of income concerns. One is section eight and the other one is, is lending with FHA loans and VA loans. And the purpose, when it comes to Section 8, the purpose of the Section 8 program, and this is from HUD's website, it increases affordable housing choices for very low-income households by allowing families to choose privately owned rental housing. And the lack of source of income coverage discourages, thwarts achievement of these goals. This is a report from the Ferndale Housing Committee. They issued 340 vouchers uh, and only 100 of the vouchers were able to be used. 240 vouchers were denied housing. And when I say 100 vouchers, it really reflects like 200 persons or more, depending how many people occupy a unit. So it's really maybe two or three times the amount. So 240 vouchers denied housing, that's, probably 500 or so, a bit over 500 people were denied housing, even though they qualified and had a voucher issue. Um, another thing that uh, turning down a voucher's impacts are people with disabilities, persons with disabilities. MISTA has waiting list preferences. They are trying to really, first priority is people that are homeless within the um, area, county where their application is made, they're given first priority, but the second priority is people that are disabled and they're applying within the county of their application. And then it goes to residency and disabled Michigan residency and so forth. So you can see it is not only is our vouchers intended to help people of extremely low income and low income, it's also intended to really serve our community for those that have disabilities. And that's just not being achieved. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages when it comes to Section 8. I'm not going to pretend, you know, um, you saw in the video, the man complained that um, he has to get an inspection, wait a couple of weeks, and then they may do a follow-up inspection. Well, that may be the case. Uh, maybe if the property was where it should have been, he would have been um, approved right away. But he said he had a tenant in the unit. So the fact that he... Um, had some delay in getting the inspection or getting approval, I don't think it affected his right to collect rent or his right to receive the voucher as a landlord. But anyway, so here's the pros. Majority of the rent is essentially guaranteed. Nobody lost any money in rent during the pandemic because all the vouchers continue to get paid. Uh, in Section 8, uh, tenants tend to occupy property for a long time. Some find it difficult to obtain approval from a public housing authority to move to a different unit. Others, because of disability and other reasons, really don't want to relocate. And another factor is a landlord doesn't even have to accept every Section 8 applicant. A landlord does all the screening mechanisms that they would normally do in terms of a tenant's credit, uh, credit score, rental history, um, anything of those natures, except when it comes to income. Income is the one factor that should be taken care of for the landlord. And then the other part, when it comes to the inspection, from at least from a municipality standpoint, is HUD and the public housing authorities take on quite a bit of responsibilities when it comes to making sure that properties are habitable. So it's a little less of a burden on municipalities to have to go and do the inspections of properties, certify them, and make sure that properties are maintained. And the fact of the matter is, too, if it's a, if it's a landlord that has you know, property well-maintained, uh, public housing authorities have discretion to do every other year, they'll do inspections to make sure the property still qualifies. Most of the problems with the housing tend to be minor and get, are readily fixable. 
Um, so some of the cons that are get raised, landlords concerned about meeting public housing authorities, minimum requirements for health and safety. But again, they have to meet those in Michigan law and other state law, they have to meet it anyways. And the public housing authority may limit rent amount to the market rate for comparable properties or comparable rental homes in the area. Um, that doesn't affect the landlord, but it will affect the availability of a voucher holder to actually be able to rent a particular property if the rent is too higher than the market rate. And there can, of course, be some delays in inspection and repair process. Hopefully, not enough, you know, when you consider the advantages to, to, to make it a problem for landlords to be in the Section 8 program. Another issue, in addition to um, vouchers, are FHA and VA loans. The purpose, according to HUD, on the VA loans help people, they help increase home ownership. That's the idea by lowering down payments, closing costs, and make it low and easy credit or um, easier credit requirements has really done a great job in increasing home ownership. The VA has a policy and purpose too to help service members, people that have served this country and their surviving survivors to buy, build, improve, or refinance a home. But the lack of source of income coverage impairs the effectiveness, blocks the achievement of the goals to be served by FHA and VA financing. This is a recent report from the National Association of Realtors and they, in 2021. On the buyer side, uh, the, when the buyers use FHA and VA loans or conventional loans, how are they received by the sellers and the seller's agents? Well, when it came to conventional financing, 60% 60, 60 were accepted with no issue. When it came to FHA loans and VA loans, there were 21% only 21% were accepted with no issues. And there's some not accepted at all because simply they're excluded out because FHA and VA loan. So they pretty much have to stand in line behind those that have applied for conventional financing. The percentage that are accepted with no issue, you can see it's very, very low for FHA and VA loans. And it gets worse when you go into a suburban and urban area where there's more competition, I believe, for properties they become placed on the market. And then on a seller side perspective, on a scale of one to five, likelihood that sellers would accept a loan from buyers with these types of loans for conventional financing, 66%, just 13% are um, very willing, right? Definitely to accept an FHA loan or VA loan or to accept a buyer who's going to purchase the home through an FHA or VA loan, just 13%. And then here's another one on a seller would definitely accept these types of loans for conventional financing. It's suburban areas, 91%, urban areas, 88%. It's even high in the rural and small town areas, but it drops significantly when it comes to FHA loans and VA loans. So there's a real need. There's a real need in jurisdictions to have source of income protections. The question is, well, how widespread is it in terms of adopting source of income protections? Well, in the, at the federal level for tenants, for rental properties, there are no federal source of income protections. It's not in the Fair Housing Act. When it comes to credit transactions, including mortgages, there is under the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, um, they're not allowed to discriminate or turn somebody down for financing if their income is derived from a public assistance program. This applies to all types of mortgage lending and all types of credit transactions. And it's right in uh, the Eagle Credit Opportunity Act at section 1691, can't be discriminated against as first as race, color, religion, national origin, sex or marital status or age. And then also can't be discriminated against because all or part of the applicant's income derives from any public assistance program. What does a public assistance program consist of? It's not defined that well in, um, not, I should say, well, it's not defined specifically in the Equal Credit Opportunity Act or the regulations, but there's official staff interpretation of the regulation, 12 CFR 1002.2Z, the official staff 
interpretation for that provision. It, it lists the various uh, public assistance programs, what qualifies under that. And really, it's really broad, any federal, state, or local governmental assistance program. And it provides what? Can it include aid to needy families, food stamps, rent and mortgage supplements, basically any type. <clears throat> it also can include social security and supplemental security income which is important because that helps serve the needs of community or persons with disabilities. So there is source of income at the federal level, but it's only for lending and credit transactions. At the state level, it's a little bit more updated information than shown in the video. It's now up to 20 states, including the District of Columbia as of January, 2022. Um, there's a couple caveats on those. Delaware has source of income protection, but landlords are not required to participate in the Section 8 program. In Maine and Minnesota, protections for voucher holders were blocked by court decisions. So it's a little bit limited there, although those states do have source of income. Within our state, Michigan, there is no state source of income protection. It's been proposed year after year. It's pending right now. It has been adopted in 13 cities, um, Ann Arbor, East Lansing, Ferndale, Grand Rapids, I'm told that in Grand Rapids, it's not currently enforced as to Section 8, according to the city attorney's interpretation of the ordinance. Um, I don't have confirmation of that, however. And then also Holland, Jackson, Kalamazoo, Kenwood, Lansing, Oak Park, Royal Oak Township, and Wyoming. I was told this week that Ypsilanti adopted source of income protection. I researched it and I was unable to confirm that. Hopefully they do. Uh, Detroit is very notable. While source of income is not mentioned in this ordinance, the ordinance grants protection based on public benefit status. And I think public benefit status is so similar to source of income, uh, but because Detroit doesn't use those magic words, when you hear about source of income or they list source of income cities and states that have source of income protection, Detroit doesn't get mentioned. It's under consideration in other Michigan cities uh, I met a couple of weeks ago with Pontiac, urging them to adopt source of income. I was with a uh, Madison Heights City Council meeting, urging them to adopt it and plan to reach out to many more cities, villages, and township, hopefully at a grassroots level to finally build up to full state protection. But it's long overdue, long overdue. Um, there's a poverty and race Research Action Council Policy Brief, P-R-R-A-C is the, is the PR, it's the normal acronym used for that organization. But currently they estimate that 50% of voucher holders live in communities with some type of source of income protection. So that's, it's pretty high already. I think it's inevitable. I just think there's, I have trouble understanding why we're waiting on having that adopted. You know, I guess it's a I, question I'd be, well, why hasn't it been adopted? It's been proposed, but why hasn't it been adopted in Michigan? Or do you favor having source of income being adopted in Michigan? Right? I think it's going to really help. I say um, in the chat, Christopher mentioned tenants need education about their legal rights court process and tenants need to get involved with organizations that address issues that hit close to home, such as housing. Amen to that. There's a real lack of education when it comes to tenants and their rights. Yeah, they don't know the proper steps and they don't know how to self-advocate for themselves. I agree. Um, I can't tell you how true that is. Um, we get calls, for example, people trying to get their security deposit back and they have no idea how to, you know, write the landlord back and, you know, leave a forwarding address within four days, you know, provide that in writing and how they have seven days to respond to the landlord's list of claim damages or claims against security deposit. And they don't know, just they have difficulty with those procedures. So Michigan actually has quite a few protections, but tenants are just not aware of it by and large. Right. Um, you know, shout out to Oakland County. We're working with Oakland County of a fair housing initiative, seeking to have villages, cities, townships within Oakland County adopt source of income protections. Charlie Cavell is an Oakland County commissioner. He's standing up, um, you see him behind the podium. 
He's urging source of income to be adopted. And uh, this is at the Ferndale Housing Commission. Um, as part of um, the Mr. Grant, we've done quite a bit of training with eight housing agencies and without exception, uh, uh, or public PHAs, public housing agencies, without exception, they all want source of income adopted. They're just desperate to have it adopted. They all, and no matter where I go, they say the same thing. They're just trying to do their work and assist people. Um, so here, uh, we have a sample source of income ordinance or statute and various exemptions. And uh, see one more quick video to show just how helpful it can be to have source of income protection. When I told them that I could like Section 8, they said they needed to talk to the landlord. Imagine having the money to pay your rent guaranteed each and every month and you still can't find an apartment. This is certainly a common complaint that we hear from clients that we serve in the shelter system. New legal challenges are pressing landlords to follow the law. Thousands of low income and homeless New Yorkers receive vouchers to cover their rent through programs like Section 8. In New York City, it is illegal to turn down a tenant simply because they're in a voucher program, and yet, Estimated 11,000 households in shelters have a voucher and still can't find an apartment. Jacqueline Simone works with the Coalition for the Homeless. They've seen landlords use increasingly creative tactics to lock out homeless New Yorkers trying to get on their feet with vouchers. That can be both overt, such as saying we don't take programs, we don't accept vouchers, or sometimes it's a little bit harder to detect. The Fair Housing Justice Center recently filed a lawsuit in federal court against several management companies. And right now, the New York City Commission on Human Rights is challenging a Parkchester housing complex in the Bronx in court. Catherine Carroll is the assistant commissioner. They take calls from homeless people with vouchers all the time. People will call us with, you know, 10, 12, 20 denials that they've received on the basis of their source of income. The Commission on Human Rights can step in and even call a landlord directly. They ask New Yorkers to reach out as soon as they're turned away. If there's a chance that that apartment is still open, we're going to do our best to be able to get them into housing. We did reach out to several landlords to try and include their voices in this piece, but we did not hear back from them. And if you've had an issue with trying to use a voucher, the city wants to hear from you. All you have to do is call 311. Reporting from the Westchester Square section of the Bronx this evening, Ayanna Harry, PIX11 News. So it can be pretty helpful. Do you know anyone who has been denied housing because of their source of income? Do you know what they are able to do or what it forced them to do? It's really telling that the ones that are, are the people that I've talked to and met with that are most pro source of income protection, right, are the public housing agencies and those other, you know, groups that administer vouchers. They really, really, really feel strongest about it. You know, they're dealing with it every single day, desperate to find landlords, desperate to find housing. Um, so a couple of things to think about drafting and uh, or proposing an ordinance or statute to provide source of income protection. First is the scope of the housing. It's clear that it would cover a house, rental house, apartment for rental, even a rooming house, uh, a co-op. Oh yeah, um, Susan mentioned that landlords charge $100 per application. There's no guarantee you'll get the unit. I think that's fraud, actually. I mean, it's almost like we have to legislate everything. Um, in meeting with Pontiac, I'm trying to urge them to get a late fee ordinance. Like District of Columbia has a late fee ordinance capping late fees of 5%. Um, but yes, how can someone, a low-income person, how many units can they apply for if they have to pay $100 per application fee? It is, it's just excessive. I would say this, like anything else, if the fee charge should bear some, at a minimum, the fee charge should bear some relationship to the costs incurred by the housing provider. For example, if they have to pay $20, $30, $40 for a um, credit report or 
criminal record report, fine. But I don't see where they come up with the hundred dollars. Some are just scamming people because they know the market and people are desperate for homes and they're just being abusive with that. If they have an 18 year old, old or older child, they have to pay another $100 hmm. reported to us, <laughs> Susan to then reported to us. Yeah, and uh, come back to the scope of covered housing. And it could even be broader, could extend to cooperative. A retirement home or new nursing home is considered a dwelling under the Fair Housing Act, but it's good to spell that out so that there's no confusion in the ordinance. And even go further with it beyond what the Fair Housing Act provides. You can do a hotel, motel, or tourist home. Example of that would be those are not covered under the Fair Housing Act because they're not considered residential dwellings. They're covered under public accommodation statutes. Um, um, like uh, Section 504, I'm sorry, um, but you know, but the thing is, it's it's better to put it in your to put it in the statute so that there's no confusion as to what would be covered. Another um, factor that needs to be consideration: specify the income source. Virtually all of them say it's a lawful source of money. Um, that's a good requirement. You don't want anybody to do illegal or any kind of you know money that they didn't earn or money that's not properly paid for them or on their behalf. Um, but it can include employment income, child support and alimony. Again, it's spell out housing assistance program, including vouchers. When I have two draft ordinances on our website, I made sure to specify section eight. Someone said, well, don't specify it because that'll help it go through. Well, I don't want, I want to, I always tell people go through the front door. If really the intent is to have section eight covered, put section eight in the ordinance. Don't leave it up for confusion later on. And then you, you're gonna run in a situation where they're gonna say, well, it's not specified in the statute of ordinance. So therefore it's not going to be covered. But you wanna have the discussion up front before any kind of statute or ordinance gets adopted. It should include public assistance, emergency rental assistance, specify, FHA and VA loans include SSI and SSDI income and any other programs administered by any federal, state, local agency or nonprofit. Um, that's just so that there's no confusion and should be all inclusive when it comes to source of income. Um, in the uh, working with um, Oakland County to put together a draft ordinance, um, the Oakland County commissioners wanted to know what the quote unquote other side. So they had uh, Greater Metropolitan Association of Realtors, GMAR, take a look at it. GMAR asked to have exemptions put in. And so there's kind of a borrowing from the Fair Housing Act has a single family exemption. It excludes owners of one to three rental homes uh, from coverage. It also excludes owner occupied exemption provided that the owner, the unit that the owner lives in or the building that the owner lives in has no more than four units. The problem though is by increasing the scope of the exemptions, it lowers the amount of housing that is available to voucher holders. So the single family exemption, and instead of doing three or fewer, you could say two or fewer, something like that. Um, there's also exemptions for religious organizations or institutions. And then it also, can prevent discounts to our housing accommodations of students, minors, veterans, and senior citizens. So I'm not big on the exemptions, uh, but I don't know, you know, a mom and pop or someone that inherits a home um, from a parent that may have passed away, you know, maybe doesn't want to take on um, vouchers. I don't know. I don't think it's that big of an issue, but, um, you know, it's something to be considered. It's good. It's not my call. It's up to um, the city council or Michigan legislature to decide what the exemption should be. But I don't think just grabbing the Fair Housing Act exemptions without thinking it through really makes the most sense. Um, the Not to get too far afield, but the Fair Housing Act exemptions were passed at a time when Congress was not sure that it was constitutional to have a fair house and nationwide fair housing ordinance. At that time in 1968, it was viewed 
as that someone's home is their castle and they can rent or not rent anybody as they deem fit. And then three months after the Fair Housing Act got passed, uh, Supreme Court ruled um, that Section 1982, another anti-discrimination law, reaches purely private housing transactions. Had the Supreme Court decision come out earlier, we probably would not have had these exemptions in the Fair Housing Act. So there's no reason to just adopt the exemptions without giving some thought as to whether they're really necessary as to a particular jurisdiction. Now, another factor is important is the enforcement mechanism. Uh, the two draft ordinances I have, one has municipal and private enforcement. It authorized municipality to impose a civil fine or even initiate a source of income complaint intake and investigation process. Uh, Mass and Heights said, you know, is there a way we can do this where the city is not involved, the city attorney is busy with many other things, and we, don't want, we really don't want the city attorney being involved in source of income complaints and enforcement. And so I did a second version, taking out anything having to do with the municipality. But what it does is it still retains and keeps the private right of action. It lets the applicant, the, pro, uh, the tenant, seek private enforcement only. And the tenant could then file for injunctive relief in court, it could be district court, well, really circuit courts are a place where injunctive relief. So it provides for circuit court jurisdiction, uh, injunctive relief, allows for compensatory damages and attorney fees. The effective date of it, the ordinances that we put together gave two year phase in period after enactment. And that gives an opportunity for the municipality, our office and others to get education, outreach and training to housing providers and landlords regarding source of income requirements prior to the effective date. Our sample ordinance is located under services and resources. It's also, um, there's two of them down there, one municipality and then the other one is private enforcement only. So what would constitute a violation of source of income protections? Uh, many of these track standard fair housing language, refusing to sell lease or make available housing because of someone's source of income. In the clip from New York City, some landlords were just overt in doing it, saying why they were turning somebody down because of um, they were a voucher holder. Others are kind of hold back or really won't come out and say it. Um, we can do it with testers, sending out testers. One tester posing as a rental applicant based on you know, employment income and another rental applicant having a voucher and then see what the landlord says to each one. Um, there can be discrimination based on source of income in terms, conditions, or maintenance or repair of a housing, you know, doing better maintenance service, repair services for someone with employment income paying rent as opposed to someone with a voucher or someone on SSI or SSDI. Um, another violation would be many, any written or oral statement, advertisement, indicating a preference limitation or discrimination based on source of income saying, well, you know, yeah, we rent to some people with voucher, really they're dispreferred and we prefer not, right? That would be a violation of that section, whether it's said orally or it's put in writing. And so forth, refusing to lend money for the purchase or repair, promoting real estate transaction that change our current, well, current area. In other words, or this area is going down because we have people with vouchers, that would be illegal to say those kinds of things. Another one is, there's an anti-retaliation provision. You can't retaliate against someone for enforcing their source of income rights. <clears throat> so what has happened when source of income has been adopted? Right? There's been few claims um, as to FHA and VA loans, few claims have been brought. I haven't been able to find one. Uh, Professor Schwem has a source of income discrimination, the Fair Housing Act article. He says no sales case has been reported under state or local source of income law. Um, so I, at this point, we don't know. I think it's good to have it there. Um, there's example of one that could be a violation would be, um, this from Schwem indicates this example, real estate broker may be concerned about a home buyer's ability to secure a traditional mortgage and thus may be less inclined to provide equal assets, access 
equal service to those using VA or other federal mortgage assistance. A realtor may also steer clients who rely on Social Security, AFDC, or other government benefits to less fluent areas, and such steering would violate an amended um, Fair Housing Act, including source of income protections. Again, that's Professor Schwem describing a case that could happen, but there just hasn't been any. So anyways, most of the claims that have been involving source of income have related to rental situations. And again, that's been thrown through, shown through intentional discrimination. Intentional discrimination can be overt where the landlord, housing provider announces why they're discriminating. In other situations, it can be shown by indirect circumstantial evidence, like I described with the testing evidence. But there's also been disparate impact claims um, have been a source of claims um, arising under source uh, statutes and ordinances protecting source of income. And it's challenges, for example, to landlords and minimum income requirement. Uh, some landlords require that the income be at least three times the rent. Um, in our area, we've had reports where landlords are requiring, or I say apartment complexes requiring, that someone's income be four times the rent. If they use three times, four times the rent amount, as a minimum qualification, a voucher holder is not going to meet it. So that would be challenged for disparate impact. It would have to, it would be proof of a statistical disparity showing that that policy, though face the three or four times uh, the rent amount, gross income has to be three or four times the rent amount, that when that facially neutral policy is applied, in application, it would have an adverse impact on voucher holders, and that would be violate section, that source of income protections. Even with these, however, non-compliance, even the jurisdictions that have adopted a source of income, there is still quite a bit of non-compliance. So it's not a cure-all, but it certainly helps in a situation where it is desperate. I want to say the um it's really important to report housing discrimination when it occurs. Remember what happened when, record, you know, write down all the information, obtain all the documents, uh, type written narrative summary in their own words of what took place is really helpful. Any witness statements, screenshots of text and voicemails, uh, make sure people do not write on original documents, make copies if they wanna make marginal notes in that, keep all originals and call the Fair Housing Center. Um, we can talk and walk clients through questions to learn more about it. And the uh, sooner we're informed of it, the better, better results we can get. In the complaint process, generally, um, there's administrative complaint and court action and DOJ. Those are the three main areas. Administrative complaint would be filing with HUD. There's a one-year limitations period, 180 days to file with the Michigan Department of Civil Rights. Court actions are two years under the Fair Housing Act but the two-year limitation period is told during the time that administrative complaint is pending with HUD or the Michigan Department of Civil Rights. A little trap on that. Administrative complaint must be pending under the Fair Housing Act. So you, if someone has a complaint before the Michigan Department of Civil Rights, make sure they have a HUD number, not just a Michigan Department of Civil Rights number. When it has a HUD number, it will be subject to tolling. There is no tolling under Michigan law. Also, unlike employment cases, there's no requirement to file with HUD or Michigan Department of Civil Rights before proceeding directly into court. There's a three-year limitation period under Michigan law, Elliot Larson and Persons with Disabilities Civil Rights Act. Three-year also under sections 1981-1982 federal law. And there's no tolling of the limitations period under any of these statutes. Department of Justice can receive complaints the time period on monetary recoveries is three years from the time the DOJ hears about the case, but there's no limitation period whatsoever for the Department of Justice obtaining injunctive relief. However, Department of Justice will only get involved when there's a pattern and practice of discrimination, multiple victims, or an overarching policy that has other many other victims. So that's a limitation on Department of Justice, but if they take the case, that's a pretty good thing. Um, because they're very selective in the cases that they'll take. And here's an important one. Where would someone file fair housing complaints? Um, I'm a plug for fair housing centers, our office, and there's others in the state. I'll show you a map on the next slide. Um, 
We're an advocacy organization. We're supposed to be, we're funded to do it. So we assist complaints in asserting their fair housing rights. We investigate and we can conduct testing. Depending on the complaint, we can negotiate for someone. We can aid the person in deciding whether they want to file with HUD or Michigan Department of Civil Rights or go directly into court. And that's a little bit different than the other groups. HUD and the Michigan Department of Civil Rights, for example, are independent federal and state agencies. They can't take a side. They have to do an impartial investigation. They won't advise anyone, right? Our role is to do just that. Um, when you go through the administrative process, you can get compensatory and monetary damages. Economic damages are damages that can be quantified, that could be lost rental amounts, application fees, things that have a specific dollar amount. Then there's non-economic damages. There's two parts of those. It can be emotional distress damages. There's also damages for lost housing opportunity. Those are not quantifiable, so they're considered non-economic damages, but they're compensatory. They're designed to compensate the victim of discrimination. Civil penalties can also be awarded up to a statutory uh, limit, like for example, 11,000, it's been increased by cost of living increases, but in the statute 11,000 for a first offense and it's higher for a second offense. They also can obtain injunctive equitable and public interest relief provisions and attorney fees. Court action is a little bit different because it also provides for punitive damages. So punitive damages are important part it, they can do civil penalties, but typically punitive damages are what you're going to see in court. Um, punitive damages can go up to, without any constitutional issue at all, 10 times the amount. So you could potentially have, I don't know, out-of-pocket expenses could be small, say $500. Emotional distress could be 25,000. So you have 25,500. Punitive damages can be, right? $255,000, that would be 10 times the amount of the compensatory damage award. So the total recovery would be around 375,000. So fair housing cases can have a high monetary award, high dollar amount. Kind of surprising people don't realize that. We had a case where a um, uh, lady was denied installing a grab bar in her unit, which she's supposed to be allowed to do. As a result, she fell, had to have knee surgery, hit her head and she had six-figure settlement over grab bars. If someone denies a ramp and someone falls and hurts, it can be a very, very large case as well. I could you know, easily consider you know, source of income. Perhaps someone you know, has to then, because they're turned down due to their source of income and that they become homeless, they go to a substandard housing, you know, and something happens to them, their belonging is stolen. I mean, there's things that happen as a result of the discrimination that no one should really take on that risk. Do the right thing, follow the law, you know, open up the housing, the people that we, housing should be available to uh, and avoid that. Um, these are the Fair Housing Center. The, Mr. put this together, it's a great little map. Even though we're the, the light blue, um, Wayne, Oakland, Macomb counties, we serve about 40% of the state population. But when each of our organizations, if we receive a complaint, you know, if we're contacted from someone in Genesee County, which is not unusual, we'll refer it to um, legal services. Uh, it's their Fair Housing Center of Eastern Michigan in Grand Rapids. There's Fair Housing Center of West Michigan. There's a Fair Housing Center in Kalamazoo. And there's one in Ypsilanti. You can see how the state is divided up. It also has the information for MISTA. And, and HUD for people need, wanting to make a complaint with their offices as well. So that's a real handy little chart. So um, what are the categories of relief in fair housing cases? There, again, there's the, I mentioned a little bit compensatory monetary relief, and those are some of the items to calculate those out. There's an equitable injunctive relief, obtaining requested housing, withdrawal of eviction filing or threatened eviction, offer to set aside the next available unit, um, removing negative credit references, providing a favorable reference. And public interest relief is designed not just for the person making the complaint, but the public at large to make sure that this doesn't occur again. It can be fair housing training, testing, can require a housing provider to adopt non-discriminatory policies, it can be affirmative marketing requirements. And a couple of cases we've had it where there's a compensation fund to uh, 
compensate other protected class members. Maybe they weren't in the case, but they still were able to be identified as having been adversely affected by discriminatory housing policy. So um, it's just important to report it, get that information. Um, I'm not going to go too much further, um, but I just you know wanted to make sure, in addition to talking about source of income, to show why it's something that really, really needs to be adopted. It's not a great stretch. It's not a great complicated thing. Um, it does provide housing for people that are low income, also provides you know, fair um, credit opportunities for people with VA and FHA. It serves the needs of people with disability. So it's a, to me, it's a win-win-win. And uh, not surprising that 20 states have adopted it. Um, I'm just kind of surprised we haven't done it yet in Michigan. I think I was told that Illinois, I believe, adopted it recently. Um, so maybe we may be at 21 right now. Um, so it's something to be considered, really. I think all of us need to advocate for us for it. If uh, there's legislation and hearings, I'm going to a hearing. I think it's going to be by Zoom on emotional support, animal legislation, Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. That's when we're, we're first on the committee, um, Michigan House Committee on their hearing. Uh, but we need to do the same thing. I'm telling myself I need to do the same thing with source of income because it really is that important. Uh, real quick on source of income resources. Uh, a real good source is again, PRRAC. Appendix B collects all the state and local source of income non-discrimination laws. It has guidance for drafting an effective source of income discrimination law. And um, it has recruiting opportunity landlords, lessons from landlords in Maryland, just to show what has happened. Um, states that have adopted gone forward source of income haven't repealed it. It hasn't been that big of a problem. It's been able actually to work out. Um, certainly it would help the needs of uh, extremely low income families and others that can't find housing. Professor Schwem has a real lengthy article. That's very helpful. I quoted it a couple of times in this PowerPoint. And again, uh, we have also on our website, a source of income brochure that has helpful information as well. If you click on the link, I'll post, if you'd like, I can post a PowerPoint on the website and you can take a look at it. Um, real quick, I, I kind of slipped over the slide, but, any questions? Any questions? Anything someone would like to share? Also, would anybody um, like to share anything else? I can save the chat for a webinar. It's easy to do. And uh, let me know. Any other future training topics that would be important to you, things you'd like us to cover? Anything else you'd like to know? Please let us know. I know I'm um, going to do an upcoming webinar for the city of Detroit, and they make a big point. They said, we want to chat. We want to know what topics are important. We want to know what kinds of questions people are asking. So please, um, you can take an opportunity to do it now, or you can you know, do it in the future, and please let us know. Um, again, our services are complaint intake, investigation, testing, enforcement, and resolution, all of these are provided free of charge. 